what happened to the Kinks. The nucleus of the Kinks, Ray and Dave Davies, were born and reared in Muswell Hill, London, and remained there throughout their lengthy, diverse career. The brothers started playing skiffle and rock and roll when they were teenagers. Peter Quaife, a fellow student of Ray's, joined them soon after. Like the Davies brothers, Quaife played guitar but switched to bass. By the summer of 1963, the band had settled on the name Ravens and had added Mickey Willett as a new drummer. Their demo tape eventually got to Shell Tommy, an American record producer working for Pi Records. In 1964, Tommy aided the band in securing a deal with Pi. Mick Avery took over for Willett as the Ravens drummer before they signed with the label. In January 1964, the Ravens released Long Tall Sally, a cover of a Little Richard song. The band's name was changed to the Kinks prior to the single's release. When it was released in February 1964, Long Tall Sally and their second single, You Still Want Me, neither song reached the charts. The third single from the group, You Really Got Me, featured a ferocious fuzz-toned two-chord riff and a frantic solo from Dave Davies. It was much noisier and dynamic. Numerous bands took the final version's powerful power chords as the basis for their own music, not only serving as a template for the Kinks' early style, but also for others, like I said. Within a month of going on sale, You Really Got Me, which was released in the US through Reprise Records, peaked at number 7. The group's fourth song, All Day and All of the Night, was released around the end of 1964. In America, it peaked at number 7. The group also released several EPs and two full-length albums during this period. The band was under a lot of pressure because they were performing non-stop and writing music at a fast clip. The American authorities barred the Kings from returning to the country after their summer 1965 American tour for an unidentified reason. The group was denied entry to the U.S. for four years, which prevented them from accessing the biggest music market in the world and virtually cut them off from the social and musical upheavals of the late 1960s. Ray Davies' lyrics changed as a result, becoming more contemplative and sentimental and relying more than the rest of his British contemporaries on overtly English musical inspirations like Music Hall, Country, and English Folk. The Kink's subsequent album, The Kink Controversy, showcased Davies' songwriting development. One of Davies' scathing social satires was Sunny Afternoon, which peaked at number one in the UK and became the greatest success of the summer of 1966 in the UK. Sunny Afternoon served as a teaser for the band's major advancement, Face to Face, which included a wide range of musical genres. They made a comeback in May 1967 with the ballad Waterloo Sunset, which in the spring of 1967 peaked at number 2 in the UK. The Kinks Something Else album, which was released in the fall of 1967, carried on the developments from face to face. The band was developing musically, but their chart performance was starting to plateau. The Kinks hurriedly released a new single, Autumn Almanac, after something else's underwhelming performance and it quickly became another big UK hit. Wonder Boy, which was released in the spring of 1968, was the group's first song since You Really Got Me to fail to reach the top 10. With Days, they partly bounced back, but the failure of their follow-up LP made their commercial collapse clear. The Village Green Preservation Society, which was published in the fall of 1968, represented the zenith of Ray Davies' growing penchant for nostalgia. Despite the album's failure, critics gave it high marks. By the end of the year, Peter Quaife had quit the band after quickly growing weary of its lack of success and John Dalton had taken his place. The Kinks were allowed to tour the U.S. for the first time in four years in early 1969 when the American government removed its embargo on them. The Kinks released Arthur prior to the start of their tour. Arthur was merely a minor success but featured uniquely British lyrical and melodic themes like his two predecessors. The Kinks added keyboardist John Gosling to their band as they started work on the follow-up to Arthur. Gosling made his debut on the Kinks' song Lola. 
Lola, which had a more solid rock foundation than their previous singles, reached the top 10 in both the UK and the US. Lola vs. Power Man and the Money Go Around Part 1, which was released in the fall of 1970, helped the group become a favorite at American concerts. It was their most popular record since the mid-1960s. Early in 1971, their pie slash reprise contract terminated, freeing them to look for a new record deal. The Kinks signed a five-album agreement with RCA Records at the end of 1971, which included a $1 million advance. Muswell Hillbillies, the band's first album for RCA, was released in late 1971, and it signaled a return to the nostalgia of the Kinks' late 1960s records, albeit with more overt country and music hall inspirations. The record wasn't the commercial smash that RCA had thought it would be. The Kink Chronicles, a double album compilation issued by Reprise a few months after Muswell Hillbillies, outsold the band's RCA debut. The double disc compilation Everybody's in Showbiz from 1973, which included one album of studio tracks and one of the live performances, was a letdown. Ray Davies wrote Preservation, a full-fledged rock opera, in 1973. The public sharply disapproved of the opera's debut performance when it finally debuted in late 1973 and received it with hostility. Act 2 was released in the summer of 1974 and people treated it worse than Act 1. For the BBC, Davies starred another musical called Star Maker. Eventually, the work evolved into Soap Opera when it was published in the spring of 1975. Soap Opera was a more commercially successful album than its predecessor despite receiving negative reviews. The Kinks recorded Schoolboys in Disgrace, Davies' third consecutive rock opera in 1976. This album rocked harder than any other RCA release by the Kinks. In 1976, the Kinks joined with Arista and transformed into a hard rock group. Their biggest American hit, Low Budget, peaked at number 11 on the charts. Give the People What They Want from 1981 achieved gold status and peaked at number 15. Since Tired of Waiting for You, Come Dancing became the group's biggest American smash hit, reaching the top 10 in 1983. The last album they would make for Arista was Word of Mouth. The band signed deals with MCA in the US and London in the UK. In early 1986, they released Think Visual, their debut album for their new label. There were no smash singles from the record despite its modest success. The Kinks issued a second live album the following year, appropriately titled The Road, which peaked briefly on the charts. The Kinks issued UK Jive, their final studio album for MCA two years later. Keyboardist Ian Gibbons quit the band in 1989. Despite being elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990, the Kinks' career did not get a boost from the honor. In 1991, a compilation of their MCA records, Lost and Found 1986 to 1989, appeared, signaling that their contract with the label had expired. Later in the year, the band signed with Columbia and released an EP called Didia, which didn't chart. Their first album for Columbia, Phobia, arrived in 1993. By this time, only Ray and Day Davies remained from the original lineup. In 1994, the band was dropped from Columbia, leaving the group to release the live album To The Bone on an independent label in the UK. They were left without a record label in the US. Despite a lack of commercial success, the band's public profile began to rise in 1995 as the group was hailed as an influence on several of the most popular British bands of the decade, including Blur and Oasis. Ray Davies was soon on popular television shows again, acting as the band's godfather and promoting his autobiography, X-Ray, which was published in early 1995 in the UK. Dave Davies' autobiography, Kink, was published in the spring of 1996. And if you have any interest in reading either of those books, I will have links in the description below. Rumors of a Kinks reunion began circulating in the early 2000s, only to be quieted following Dave Davies' stroke in June 2004. 
Dave would later recover fully, spurring another round of reunion rumors in the late 2000s, yet nothing materialized. Peter Quaife, the band's original bassist, died of kidney failure on June 23, 2010. Following his death, Ray started demoing material with Mick Avery and Dave slowly became part of the project. As the band prepared a 50th anniversary reissue of the Kinks or the Village Green Preservation Society, the Davies brothers and Avery confirmed they were working on a new Kinks album, the first the drummer was involved with since 1984's Word of Mouth. Before any new music appeared, the Kinks celebrated the 50th anniversaries of both Arthur and Lola with deluxe edition reissues which appeared in 2019 and 2020 respectively. The anniversary editions continued in 2022 when Muswell Hillbillies and Everybody's in Showbiz, the first two albums released under the RCA contract, were paired in a deluxe box set. And that's what happened to the Kinks. Thank you for watching and like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I just want to give a shout out to Elmo Lewis. He's the one that requested this video. And if you want your request to be done, let me know in the comments below. Check me out on Patreon and I'll see you in the next video.